y'all and welcome back to the channel. Before I get into some videos I have planned that are a little heavier in topic, I thought it would be fun to do something just more entertaining and lighthearted and discuss Liberty Tees. Now, Liberty Tees are just kind of what we call the alternatives American colonists found so that they could avoid buying tea from the East India Company and paying taxes to Great Britain. Um, I think most of my viewers are probably familiar with the Tea Act of 1773 and the subsequent Boston Tea Party, right? Um, but taxes on tea, they were nothing new, uh, nor was the objection to paying them. So just to recap quickly for anyone who may not be aware of this or had just forgotten, the Tea Act of 1773 was not actually a new tax. Instead, it was a discount on the uh, towns and duties of 1767 to kind of encourage the colonists to buy tea from the East India Company, which was a company in serious need of an economic boost, to uh, put it one way. And um, this Tea Act, it was interpreted a couple different ways by the colonists, whether, you know, it was seen as undermining American merchants who would typically be selling the tea, or it was seen as undermining the colonists who had already been boycotting the tea ever since 1767 to try to coerce them into, you know, kind of tease and tempt them back into buying tea again. So for the latter, it's really just the principle of it that's upsetting them. But for the former, when it comes to the merchants, um, a big problem there is that um, the East India Company, they decided that they were going to export their, um, their tea directly. So instead of just selling it to these American merchants to actually be able to get like a small chunk of the profit, the East India Company decided to open warehouses in major American cities and, and sell their tea directly. So this is really undercutting those American merchants. Um, but that's enough. That's enough of a recap. I really do want this to just focus on some of the commentary on tea that I found in colonial newspapers and the alternatives they were discussing publicly. Uh, so let's let's jump to that, shall we? In 1768, one letter published in the Boston Gazette, it encouraged what they described as, quote, one resolution more, which would do us more essential service than all the rest. I mean a resolution to discard from our houses that most pernicious article of luxury, tea." End quote. Now, the same author goes on to explain that the immense quantities of tea that are imported to the colonies represent far more tax revenue than anything else from the towns and duties. So this is what they felt um, was the most important thing to boycott. But there's also further concern on their part because, quote, the whole continent is so bigoted and devoted to tea that there is really some reason to fear they would part with all their liberties and religion too, rather than renounce it." End quote. That last bit kind of made me chuckle because as a southerner, I sometimes feel that way about my sweet tea. But of course, there were some people who tried to persuade their fellow colonists to be patriotic by persuading others of the ill effects of drinking tea. Uh, the Boston Weekly Newsletter published an excerpt from a doctor's essay, and, and we know how doctors of this period gave such good health advice, um, but it, it claimed warm beverages were unhealthy, which if that were true, it would mean that I'm in a lot of, I'm in a lot of trouble. And the Pennsylvania Packet later published a letter supposedly from a, a girl named Julia to her friend. Uh, describing the illness she suffered due to drinking tea and apparently her, her subsequent death due to it. Sounds a bit questionable to me, but stories to scare the daylight out of people can be effective, right? The Massachusetts Gazette, on the other hand, you know, they're, they're trying to do damage control and they published a notice to the public stating that tea in moderation is good for the health and the only concern is if you're buying adulterated tea that that that's where the danger comes from i don't know if there's any truth to claims of adulteration going on this isn't victorian england after all but it's possible and if it really did make julia sick maybe that's why who knows but one of the alternatives the colonists found was to try to dry and use tea leaves from plants that had been imported to and grown in america so, you know, like the tea plants from Asia, 
that they're used to buying, that the dried version of, they imported these plants and they were trying to grow it domestically. Um, how this is supposed to be getting around the fact that drinking tea is supposedly unhealthy, I don't know. Um, but J.P. Popper, at least that's the name they signed, responds to a request in the Boston Gazette for instructions on how to process black tea for this purpose. And in his reply, he gives instructions not just for processing black teas, but he also mentions that sage and balm are good substitutes. And I assume he means lemon balm. Then in 1773, I found an article published under the pseudonym Philo Aletheus. I don't speak Latin. I don't claim to know how this is supposed to be pronounced, by the way. Um, but they published a considerable list of alternatives, which was like a gold mine for me when I'm doing the research for this video. And with each of the options in their list, they provided a number of claimed health benefits to, to reinforce the use in lieu of imported tea. Uh, I'm not going to list all those supposed health benefits. Um, of all the articles I found, though, this is the one I thought was the most interesting. So let's go through their list. First is sassafras root, sliced thin and dried with raspings of lignum vitae. Second, sweet marjoram and a little mint. Third, mother of thyme and a little hyssop. Fourth, sage and balm leaves, potentially with a bit of lemon juice added. This reminds me of Popper's suggestion from 1768. And again, I'm going to clarify that likely means lemon balm. Um, though they could mean bee balm or anything from the mint family, I suppose. But I'm thinking lemon balm is the best choice. Uh, fifth, rosemary and lavender. Six, a very few small twigs of white oak, well dried in the sun, with two leaves and a half of sweet myrtle. Very specific there. Seventh, clover with a little chamomile. Eight, twigs of black currant bushes. Nine, red rose bush leaves and sink foil. Ten, mistletoe and English wild valerian. They also note that this tea is not the most pleasant but tolerable. And uh, I have a feeling a lot of these blends would fall into that category for me. Uh, Eleven, pine buds and lesser vervain. If I recall correctly, pine buds are full of vitamin C. So, okay, I, this, I could see a, a benefit in this one. Number 12 is ground ivy with a little lavender cotton or Roman wormwood or southernwood. Uh, bonus, they say this kills worms in children. Um, I believe it. I think there are still some herbal remedies that, that use wormwood. Number 13, fennel seed and inner bark of magnolia, commonly called spicewood. Uh, all I have to say about this one is, yuck, I hate fennel. Um, number 14, strawberry leaves and leaves of sweetbriar or dog's rose. Number 15, goldenrod and betony. 16, twigs of the liquid amber tree, commonly called sweet gum, with or without flowers of elder. Number 17, peppermint and yarrow. Now, the 17th one I actually tried out a couple days ago, just out of curiosity. Uh, it wasn't awful, <laughs> but the yarrow has a, a distinct flavor to it. I, I think I'd have to have some sugar in this. Mint, I can do unsweetened, so I don't know. Um, now, this article also added one more, a tea made with hairy moss for those of Virginia and Maryland who live in, quote, the low and damp lands, end quote. Uh, in contrast to claims that were made about black tea around the same time, this person says, quote, These are all so safe and innocent that except the 3rd, 10th, and 12th, a pregnant lady may drink them with safety and many with advantage, end quote. Uh, please note, I am not telling any 21st century pregnant women to drink or not to drink these blends. Okay, thanks. Yep. Uh, and personal note, I think the flavor of spearmint is way better than peppermint. It's just a, it's a little more nuanced, a little softer. I don't know how to describe that kind of thing. Uh, but I bet there are a bunch of colonists who agreed with me on that point. Now, colonists found all sorts of substitutes, and a lot of this would vary depending on what colony you're living in, what plants are growing there. Um, so d don't see this as some complete list of the Liberty Teas that were in use. But I, I do think it's an interesting kind of glimpse 
at what was going on, what people were trying, what they were recommending to each other, um, and the general thoughts that were going around. So if you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button for me and comment below with your own favorite uh, tea that you like to drink. My own favorites are probably Lady Grey, which obviously doesn't count as a Liberty tea, um, but also like a Spearmint or a Rosemary. Uh, rosemary tea was surprisingly good when I tried it, um, but maybe not Rosemary and Spearmint mixed together. I have not tried that yet. So thanks for watching y'all and I look forward to seeing you with the next video.